asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. So I'm going to start off then, unsurprisingly, with the latest news on Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Yulia, whom were found collapsed on a bench in a supermarket in Salisbury on Sunday. And there was, there was a lot of talk about this through Monday and, well, Monday evening mostly, and through Tuesday all day yesterday, a lot of speculation. And it's only late this afternoon that the police investigating this have said that they believe the victims were targeted specifically. They believe that, they're saying. They're not offering any evidence at this stage. I suppose you could make the argument that they couldn't offer any evidence this stage, not to the press anyway, evidence that might prejudice any future court case. So I understand that. They're saying they believe that a nerve agent was used on uh, Skripal and his daughter. That's what they're saying they believe. This was announced by Assistant Police Commissioner Mark Rowley today. So again, it's short on detail. But what st- struck me as very interesting, and I want to get into this now, was the coverage of this again over the last two days. Now, I know I got into this in some detail in the first hour of last night's programme, but I want to talk a little bit more about that and kind of flesh that out a bit. Um, There's a Tory MP called Tom Tugentat, Tom Tugentat, Conservative MP, and he chairs the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Now, since Monday, he's been blaming Russia. He put a urgent question to the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson. This is what led up to Johnson speaking about this yesterday. Tom Tugentat is leading the blaming of Russia. He hasn't been asked to offer any corroborating evidence in any of the programmes that he's appeared on, and he's been on all of them, saying that Russia did it, Russia did it, the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin. And he's getting more brazen, uh, and I would say ultimately more foolish, I would say, as the week has gone on. He went on to BBC Radio 5 Live Breakfast this morning. That's a programme hosted by Nikki Campbell and Rachel Burden. And Rachel Burden interviewed Tom Tugentat, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, and I use the word interview advisedly. In terms of our exploration and our our evaluation of how the mainstream media is operating, this is something to behold. It really is. Rachel Burden asks Tom Tugentat what's his hunch about the falling ill, the sickness of Sergei Skripal and his daughter. Silly question because Tugentat has been running all over town saying that the Russians did it. But anyway, Burden says, Rachel Burden, she says, Tom, what's your hunch? None of us can say what happened for certain, but we can certainly look at a pattern. And what we're looking at is a pattern that we've seen appearing in other countries and at other times in the United Kingdom. We're seeing a pattern of somebody who has fallen out with the Kremlin, uh, finding themselves uh, in a state of toxic shock or poisoning or whatever it is, uh, for some unexplained or difficult to find uh, reason, and uh, and and of course, absolutely no fingerprints uh, from anybody else. Well, it begins to get a little bit suspicious, doesn't it? You know, you get to the point where if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, well, it's, it's probably a duck. And, and this time, it looks again. You know, we've got some poisoning. We've got uh, a Russian who's fallen out with the Kremlin, and uh, we've got. Um, a, 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 a serious diplomatic incident arising. I mean, this this looks exactly like the Kremlin playbook. If it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Mm. It looks like the Kremlin playbook, Tom Tugendhat said. Now, I know what you're thinking. Lois Lane here, Rachel Borden, jumps right down his throat and says, what playbook? What are you talking about, Mr Tugendhat? The police have said they haven't got a Scooby-Doo. Here's Rachel. Yeah, it's a pretty sinister duck, to be honest, isn't it? And Boris Johnson seemed a little bit more certain of the origins of this incident when he spoke to the House of Commons yesterday. But it took seven years to conclude that Litvinenko had probably been killed on the orders of the Russian state. Is it going to take as long to conclude the same thing in this case? Yeah, holy cow, Batman, that's worth a listen back. In response to the charge that it's straight out of the Putin playbook, the Kremlin, this guy fell out with the... 
with the Russian state and we know what happens to people who fall out with the Russian state. Instead of asking him questions, this is what Borden said. Yeah, it's a pretty sinister duck, to be honest, isn't it? And Boris Johnson seemed a little bit more certain of the origins of this incident. Yeah, it's a pretty sinister duck. And Boris Johnson seems pretty certain as well, says, Rachel, I don't think I have to tell you that's appalling journalism and the worst type of presenting imaginable to not challenge him. Anyway... Does Tug and Hat think it will take as long to get to the bottom of this story as it did to get to the bottom of the Alexander Litvinenko story? Well, I hope very much not. I mean, I think that uh, one of the things that we've got to do as a country is call out Russia for what it's doing. You know, Russia is one of the great countries of the world and should very much play its part uh, in the international system. But instead of doing that, what it's doing is it's acting as a thug and a bully because it's it's propping up a, a, a regime of thieves who stole millions and millions of the Russian people and, uh, and are hiding their wealth all over the place. But as yet we have no evidence, do we? And isn't there a danger that we might be really damaging our relationships with a very important country like Russia, which has huge influence and sensitive issues around the world, particularly, for example, its role in Syria and Ukraine, and we really need to maintain solid diplomatic diplomatic ties with them. Redemption of sorts there from Rachel. Very, very late, but redemption of sorts. The producer must have been shouting at her to ask him a question, and she eventually did. But her redemption was short-lived, sadly. She reverted to type pretty quickly. It's over to Tom. Well, you're, you're right that it does have huge influence in Syria, where it's been assisting uh, Assad gassing and murdering his own people. You're right, it's got influence in Ukraine, where it's just... Well, they would also invaded. say that they are fighting jihadi terrorists there. Well, they may do, but they're lying because what they're actually doing is they're gassing uh, civilians in eastern Ghouta. They're bombing uh, civilian areas, uh, or at least they were around Aleppo before they murdered so many of them. The resistance uh, died out. And they have consistently propped up a dictator who sees absolutely no problem with using chemical weapons against his own people. In Ukraine, they've changed the borders of Europe by force for the first time since the Second World War. I mean, that's really quite something. I mean, nobody since Hitler has done it. And now we've got uh, a regime changing the borders of a European state by force. Jump in any time you want, Rachel, to stop him and challenge him to provide evidence of any of this. Force. Uh, and that's, you know, that's really quite something. They've also just, by the way, as a, an aside, invaded Georgia, kidnapped Estonian security officials, uh, attacked and brought down... Any chance you're going to jump in, Rachel, and ask him about the evidence to link them to kidnapping people and stuff like that? Any time... Just jump in and stop him. He's a politician. It's your job to hold him to account and to demand that he can support what he is claiming with some genuine evidence. Anytime you want, Rachel. Uh, The financial network of Estonia about 11 years ago. They've also been using uh, propaganda means through uh, what we would call information. Yeah, they were behind the great train robbery. They knocked off JFK. They sacked York back in 11, whatever it was. They won the Battle of Hastings. What else is he going to claim the Russians are responsible for before Burden will say, hang on a second? Information warfare, they uh, have laughably come up with the phrase fake news, but it is information warfare on various channels to um, call into question even our own uh, news sources. If you're that angry, and those really are very strong allegations, then the UK ought to be taking... Sorry, they're they're not allegations, they're facts. Okay, okay. If if the facts are as you state them, then we really ought to be taking stronger action against Russia, oughtn't we? Rather than saying, we're not going to send a couple of officials to the World Cup. Wow, you think journalism can't sink any lower in this country? Tugendhat has made... At least a dozen allegations about the Russian state that have not and cannot be substantiated. He's blamed them for everything, really. The only thing he didn't blame him for was the Kentucky Fried Chicken disaster last week when the bad weather put paid to KFC deliveries. I think if he had blamed him for the KFC crisis, Borden wouldn't have jumped in and said, well, can you prove that? Estonia, Ukraine, kidnappings, all manner of things. He called them facts... She asked for no evidence. She said, OK, if they are facts, why aren't we taking stronger action against Russia? They talked about the World Cup. Tugentan said he did not support an English team boycotting the World Cup. England should go and play, he said. But he couldn't resist trying to scare English fans about the deep 
Russian police state, the dark police state. You can hear this on BBC Radio 5 Live's podcast. He said they should go to the World Cup, but then he went on to try and scaremonger fans going to the uh, to the World Cup, to Russia, saying that if you get into trouble there, you could be in serious trouble. Now, at this stage of the interview, I swear to God, and remember, I'm a teacher, I've taught radio production. This is my area of expertise. If you have an area of expertise, this is it. This is so dreadful. At this stage, her performance is so woeful that Nikki Campbell, I know, Nikki Campbell, has to come to her rescue. And if Nikki Campbell is coming to clean up your presenting, to clean up your interview, you're in serious trouble. Have a listen. Well, look, Russia is a truly beautiful country. And uh, and, and if people do go, I'd just say be careful. It really is a police state, so don't cross the line because you will find that uh, your passport does not afford you as much protection as you hoped because it is not a country that uh, values the rule of law in any way at all. Uh, and so if you get in trouble, uh, be careful. The police are not there to help you. They're there. You see, he's, he, he's going on and on and on and on and on. There's no sign of burden stopping him. He's now saying if you go to Russia, you've got to be very careful because the police are not there to help you. It's a desperate country. This is kind of Cold War stuff. He's talking John Le Carré novel type stuff here. Have a listen to this. Careful, the police are not there to help you. They're there. The police are not there to help you in Russia. There to help the state and to keep order for the government. And yet we, we welcome the Prince of Saudi Arabia. To the- so Campbell jumps in. Campbell, as bad as he is, has had enough of this. And Campbell says, and yet we welcome the Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman. We welcome the Prince of Saudi Arabia to this country. Okay. Um, with their human rights record, um, would you shake his hand? Would you welcome him? I mean, well, why are they in any way morally better than Russia? They're not. I'm not making a moral statement. I'm making a statement about the who's The Queen is having better. tea with the, the, this the, prince the, from the Saudi direction, Arabia. But the direction of travel is remarkably different. While Putin is dragging his nation downwards, Prince Mohammed bin Salman is, is trying to raise it. Mm. What he's doing well, is trying letting to Letting women drive. Well, much more than that, actually, shaking down corruption, um, reforming ownership rights, trying to introduce uh, much wider forms of education, trying to reform uh, ownership models in businesses, introducing, uh, making sure that business opportunities exist for younger people. Now, he's making mistakes, and I'm, you know, I'm... As, as Great opportunities for selling of... arms to Saudi Arabia as well, so we mustn't forget that. Uh, well, actually, much more a great opportunity for us to have influence over one of the great countries in the region and uh, actually try and do some good here because they are making mistakes in Yemen and I've spoken out about it and I don't think that we should be uh, selling uh, to, the, to, 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 to fund that, to fuel that war. What did he say there? He didn't honestly say that the Saudis are making mistakes in Yemen, did he? Is that what he said? They are making mistakes in Yemen. What? They are making mistakes in Yemen. Say that again. They are making mistakes in Yemen. Ah. So the mass murder of hundreds of thousands of civilians using sophisticated weaponry is a mistake. Just a mistake. 20 minutes past the hour. This is the Richie Allen Show, live from Manchester on the 7th of March, 2018. My name is Richie Allen. Let's move on. Speaking of the Saudi Arabian prince, Theresa May has said... She um, will be raising concerns about the human rights record of Saudi Arabia during the visit of Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He's here for a three-day visit. Uh, There are protests planned for the man, uh, protests about the country's role in Yemen. Jeremy Corbyn accused the government of colluding in war crimes by selling arms to Riyadh. But the Prime Minister said ties between the two nations had actually saved lives. This is the inversion. Uh, the 32-year-old crown prince who arrived today is seen by some as a modernising force in the Gulf state. He's already had lunch with the Queen and the Duke of York and he's due to have dinner this evening with the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Cambridge. How lovely. Of course, Theresa May won't be asking him about Yemen, Yemeni casualties. May couldn't give a damn. She gave him the weapons, knowing what he was going to do with them. Give a child a selection box and then go back a week later and ask, what did you do with the chocolate? Jesus. Anyway, Leo Doherty is an MP, a Tory MP. He's on the Arms Exports Committee and he was on the Adam Bolton show on Sky News earlier. 
and Leo Doherty, the member of the Arms Exports Committee, well, he loves Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He is a, a hugely impressive uh, character. He's a man of great energy uh, and vision. And I think what is interesting at this moment in Saudi Arabia's history, where what they need more than anything else is leadership, I think he is, I think he is the man they need. But uh, there is uh, what the UN says is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world at the moment in Yemen. 11 million people perhaps facing mm. starvation. Mm. Uh, Saudi attacks uh, using British weapons responsible for that. I mean, should we be welcoming at all in those circumstances? Well, I think we should be welcoming, but I think we should acknowledge also that the Saudis see this as a, as a war of necessity, not one of choice. Um, I think they, they, they want it to come to an end. I think they have taken measures to, to limit civilian casualties. And I also think that our role in uh, our defence relationship with Saudi has enabled them to do that. And I've been into the command and control centre in Riyadh where they allocate targets. So if we weren't involved, it would be, I think it would be much worse. Whoa, hang on a second there. Leo, did you just admit to being a war criminal on live television? I'm sure you did. And I've been into the command and control centre in Riyadh where they allocate targets. So if we weren't involved, it would be, I think it would be much worse. Say that again. And I've been into the command and control centre in Riyadh where they allocate targets. So if we weren't involved, it would be, I think it would be much worse. Yes, he admitted to being a war criminal on live television. Leo said, I've been in the command and control centre where they allocate targets. So he saw it firsthand, the blowing to kingdom come of civilians and women and children, and he didn't do anything about it. He actually said it would have been worse if I wasn't there. Wow. So Adam Bolton asks them again, should we be arming murderers? Should we be arming uh, the Saudis to fight and kill people in Yemen? Well, I think it's a le they have a legitimate uh, basis of, uh, of security for, for, for being there. So, so uh, I think, uh, and, and because we've got a close relationship, uh, we can have a positive I influence so, on the so way So what, what do you think, you know, privately, the Defence Secretary, the Prime Minister, can say to MBS yeah. about Yemen? I think they can say, look, we acknowledge that you have a justified uh, case for being there, but we can help you extricate and we can help you patch up the kind of diplomatic uh, fudge that is required for you to extricate yourself. Yeah. <laughs> wow. We can help you extricate yourself from the diplomatic fudge. Who are these people? Like Leo Doherty. I'll tell you who they are. They're psychopaths, right? He was out there in a control room, allocating targets, whatever that means. What does that mean? I was out there helping them allocate targets. Wow. And he didn't care. And they love this guy, Mohammed bin Salman, that much that even Adam Bolton, the presenter, referred to him as MBS. They're humanising this guy, MBS. This weekend, some poor bastard will have his head lopped off on a football pitch in Riyadh. Uh, this, this is true. Some woman will be whipped till there's no skin on her back because she'll have been called an adulteress. This is true. But MBS is meeting the Queen and the Duke of York, so everything is fine. Psychopaths. And don't tell me that everything would be okay under Jeremy Corbyn because Corbyn said to me we shouldn't be colluding in war crimes. But his shadow foreign secretary, Emily Thornberry, didn't get the missive, the message even. She was on Sky News today. This is Thornberry. If Labour were to come to power, what would you do? Would you immediately end all arms trading with Saudi Arabia? What we would do is we would say uh, that there needs to be an independent inquiry. Jesus, Emily, the answer is yes. <laughs> it couldn't be any simpler. If Labour got into power, would you end arms trading with Saudi Arabia? Yes. Yes, I would, Sarah Jane. If I was Foreign Secretary, I would stop it today. What I would do is I would have an inquiry. Let's have an inquiry. ...with Saudi Arabia? What we would do is we would say uh, that there needs to be an independent inquiry into how these bombs have been used. There is great concern that there have been breaches of international law because, because civilians have been targeted. There have been hundreds and thousands of, of individuals that have been killed. We have seen farmland being killed, hos hospitals being targeted. We yeah, they're killing the farmland, they're targeting hospitals and tellingly she said they're killing hundreds of thousands of people. When asked if you were in government next week, would you stop selling arms to the Saudis? 
meh. What we would do is we'd have an inquiry. Marvellous. Must be lovely to be in a place like Yemen. When will they stop the... When will they stop the bombing? You might think if you were in uh, any part of that country. And somebody says, well, we're going to have an inquiry. So we'll have to wait. It's 27 minutes past the hour. Let me just clarify something. I've been a journalist for many years. I'm honest. I have no idea whether the Russians were involved in the incident that led to the hospitalisation of Sergei Skripal. I said this last night. I wrote this on my website. I have no idea. You see, real journalism is to tell the truth with the facts available to hand. Vladimir Putin is not a nice man. I know this because I'm a journalist. I know all about the corruption that went on around the Sochi Olympics. I know all about the things that Putin was doing in his earlier years. He's no different, he's no better, he's no worse than the agents of the CIA, the MI6, Mossad. That's where he comes from. I don't like him. I don't like oligarchs. But I don't like members of parliament going along with Russophobic propaganda to try and turn the country against Russia making statements that they can't they can't qualify with evidence that's not journalism and the BBC should be jumping all over these people and saying hang on a second the police are still saying well we think it might be nerve agents we think they were targeted journalism is to make a statement when you've got facts that can support it in fact journalism isn't that at all I'm talking through my backside journalism is to ask these people questions about the facts that they do or don't have and expose them when they're lying and when they're not lying through your questioning allow them to put facts on the table it's dreadful dreadful to hear Leo Doherty admit this guy on the arms exports committee admit that he was in control rooms in Riyadh watching the carpet bombing of people and Adam Bolton sat there and twiddled his thumbs and didn't ask the question that I asked, which was, Leo, did you just admit on live television that you might be exposed to future questions about war crimes? It's a crazy, crazy world we're living in.